Welcome to the North Pentecostal Church live stream, a place to be family. I would normally ask everyone to stand at this point, but that'd be kind of weird. So uh, we're going to play a couple songs today. Uh, just join me in worshiping the Lord today. So this is Glorious Day. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was not true till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. Failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I made you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. To your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. To your glorious day. Mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The hope made new Jesus, when I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness to your glorious day. My sin was heavy, chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, and now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, and now your love is here that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, to your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness to your glorious day. This one's called The Lion and the Lamb. Coming on the clouds 
The kings and kingdoms will bow down. As every chain will break, as broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring you power in fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Keep saying that. Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. is Amazing Grace. That's the song of the name. This 
This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all glory This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. We're going to bring it down do one worship song here. So this is called Holy Ground. It's a new one. Hopefully you know it's by passion. Show us your glory and 
morning. It is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, the history of that would be that this is the day we celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit on earth. The day where he came to the church as they gathered in the upper room after Jesus instructed them to wait until the promise of the Father came. It is the moment where everything changed for us because as believers, we now have the opportunity to share the gospel in boldness and power as he comes upon us. Today, we're going to look at the story of this first Pentecost through the lens of the events themselves. What was involved leading up to uh, the Spirit coming on the believers and how it impacted their lives. We'll also consider how this should reflect in our lives and what it means for us in the season we currently live in. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1 and 2. If you're unfamiliar with the book of Acts, it is Luke's second book following his telling of the gospel. To get a clear picture of the whole story, uh, you should consider reading Luke and Acts as one cohesive book, not as two separate ones, not separated by other readings in between. Uh, by doing this, it will allow you to not only see Luke's theology, but get a better scope of timelines and historic events as well. So to this point in time, Jesus has done his few years of powerful ministry. He's been arrested, crucified, buried in a tomb, and then victoriously resurrected. Then he appears to many people over the course of a number of weeks, and we come to the moment where he is about to ascend to his throne in heaven. Gathered with the disciples one last time, he has a conversation with them about the days that are about to come. We're going to pick that up in Acts 1, verse 4. Here's what it says. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So in this incredible picture, the disciples and a small crowd of people are gathered with Jesus enjoying a meal. It's that um, real image of fellowship that we spoke of last week. It's there that he instructs them not to leave Jerusalem until they receive the gift that the Father has promised them, the outpouring of the Spirit in the form of baptism. Uh, John had actually prophesied this earlier at the outset of Jesus' ministry. For one will come who, pro who baptizes in fire. You have to understand something about this time of waiting that the disciples and those with them are committed to. Um, the place that they're told to wait is not exactly a safe place for them. Jerusalem was not an area that they were just set on total safety. It's not just mild inconvenience. It wasn't a simple threat of people mocking them. This was a timeline where Jesus had not long ago been crucified and his, for his message, and his followers are now actively under the same measure of persecution. Their lives were at risk. And Jesus is asking them to stay in the center of that danger to wait for the gift that he has just mentioned. And so they wait. So some would come and go as they needed to get resources like food and maybe they had jobs that they needed to be in in order to leave at the right time or family that needed them. Whatever the important reason was, they left occasionally, but for the most part they stayed committed to being in one place uh, and this resulted in a few traits uh, important to the mission that they were about to set out on wait, when the waiting time ended. We're going to look at those. The first is devout expectancy. If you've ever been on the side of waiting for something promised, you know this level of expectancy. Perhaps you've been promised a uh, job promotion. Perhaps you have, are, are waiting to graduate from school. You're waiting for that incredible piece of paper that says you finished, here's your diploma, here's your master's, whatever it is. Or maybe the most applicable to this, you're waiting or have waited for the birth of a child. That sense of excitement and maybe even nerves um, for what is about to come around, it sets on you every day. And the closer you get to it, to the revelation of this promise, the excitement builds even more. The disciples and those with them would encounter this in a supernatural way. The promise they were waiting on is not a material gain or temporal significance. The Holy Spirit will bring them what is needed to take the message that is within them and speak it in absolute boldness and power. And so being commanded by Jesus to wait, they stay in Jerusalem, begin the process of being patient with God. You ever been in a place where you have to be patient with God? 
Maybe you've heard him speak something to you of a promise or he said this, this will come to pass. And then you ask him the question, okay, God, when? When? His response often is simply just wait. I was there a few years ago. I knew, could sense that God was up to something, moving us from where we were in BC to something different. And so I took the moment in boldness and I said to him a very simple question, okay, God, when? Now, if you're not ready for the answer, don't ever ask God when. Because he, in, you know, he was looking at me probably, but he literally says to me, when I say so. It, very profound, very simple answer, when I say so. In other words, he said to me, Larry, just wait. Just be patient. Go about your day. I'll let you know. And so we waited. We went about the mission that we had and continued every day with all that we had, but with great expectancy of what God was about to do. And let me tell you, being patient with God is made easier with expectancy. To wait in belief of the gift gives encouragement and excitement. But to wait in simple process becomes monotonous and creates a sense of undue suffering. I dreamed of the difference that God would bring. I thought about where it might be, the people that we might uh, be around. But I stopped thinking about when. And I just said, God, I'm going to devote myself to what is now. And when you open that door, I know it will come. And eventually that phone call came. And it was that moment where uh, it's that sense that I could see the cloud in the distance after waiting for the rain. We knew the season was about to change. When you're waiting in expectancy for God to move, each day, each minute is full of this electric excitement because you also begin to see God, what God is doing around you in the lives of those that you live with. You see how he's preparing their lives for his move, for what he's going to do through you. In this waiting time, the disciples also had an earnest desire to do God's work. They wanted desperately to get out and preach the message of life change through Jesus, of eternal life through his death and resurrection. Within their spirit was a word that had the power to change lives, to change the world. But Jesus and the Father had a plan to fully empower them, so they had to wait. Do you know what happened to their desire for mission while they waited? It grew. It deepened. They caught a bigger passion for Jesus and his work than they would ever had beforehand. In some moments of waiting, we lose desire to move ahead, but the disciples' desire grew every day as they waited for this coming promise. They saw Jesus work through the power of the Spirit, and now they knew they were promised that same Spirit, this same gift is going to be theirs and will be for the, all of those who desire it. The message of Jesus' salvation is about to be exponentially empowered through the coming of the Spirit upon them, and the addition of his presence in the lives of others will make it that much more profound. The Spirit is coming to the earth and will set the harvest fields to be ready for those who bring this message. Another thing happens as the disciples wait. They begin to pray in unity. Imagine a room of 120 people with one purpose in their prayers. What would it sound like? How would it feel? United prayer is the spontaneous offspring of their expectancy and desire. They begin to, I imagine, pray for the lives of those they will impact, the cities they'll go into. They pray for energy and boldness to carry this incredible message. Maybe they begin to ask for incredible favor with kings and rulers of countries, the nations that they'll walk into. Yes, they pray to be kept safe from harm, but more than that, they pray that if they should face harm, that they would do so with an expectancy that God's hand would move and it would match the level of expectancy that they have waiting for this gift to come now. They pray for an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus' salvation with any and all who would listen. Then they pray for one another as well, to be encouraged at all times, to hear God's voice of leading and to remain obedient in every season. They set aside personal ideals and comforts for the purpose of praying that God's kingdom would fully come to earth. From this time of waiting and the internal as well as the external actions within uh, this waiting period, there is a very important result that we must account for and in our lives we must anticipate. 
there was a personal preparation for the disciples. God was about to give them the fullness of his presence and the person of the Holy Spirit, and he used this time of waiting to prepare each and every one of them for the work that they were about to take up. We're told exactly what this looks like in verse 8 of Acts 1. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The message of Jesus' grace and God's mercy began in Jerusalem and spread outward to the rest of the world. If you're a believer today, your faith can be directly attributed to the waiting time of the disciples, to their personal preparation. This is a practice that each one of us should become accustomed to. See, this season that we are in, one that we've been living out for about a year now, should not have been only in your mind about what we can and can't do, who we can and can't see. It should be about what God is doing and what he is about to do. I believe that this season has been about preparing each one of us. It's been an inconvenience. We definitely would love to gather with many people, to be with our family, to be with our friends. But he is using this time to get you ready for the move that is ahead of us. It is our position right now to wait in devout expectancy with earnest desire and to pray together to be personally prepared for what he is about to do. Have you in this season prayed for your community? Have you in this season prayed for your pastors? Have you been desiring a new move of God? Have you come in expectancy of what is about to happen? Have you asked that God prepare you for the work he is going to release for you? See, I ask these questions because there's a principle you need to know when it comes to the waiting and the preparation. In Acts 2, verses 1 to 2, we read the following. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came upon them from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. If you continue to read, you realize what happened from that. But this is the picture we need to focus on. The believers who were gathered in the upper room had positioned themselves in a posture of obedience and receiving. They knew the gift was coming. But the principle of this is that power comes only after positioning. If you look through uh, each one in Scripture who was used in incredibly mighty ways of God, all of them were positioned as people who committed to the work of God and his kingdom. David set his heart after that of God's. Daniel would not worship any other but his God. Moses and later Joshua led the nation of Israel, and every day they were constantly positioning themselves as servants of Jehovah and friends of God. When Paul was realigned by God and became um, the self-proclaimed slave of Jesus, he was sold out to the work of the kingdom. Each one of these and many others, Elijah, Deborah, Peter, Mary, and so many others, found that the power that mattered most came through submission to the Father, a posture of expectancy of God, one to receive his leading and also his empowerment. And now to us, we have the opportunity to be positioned to receive power that only comes from God. And it comes through the very thing that we likely don't want to do. Wait. Waiting sets your posture in a few key ways. First, it gives you availability. The Bible says that God will fight for you. You need only be still. That if we wait on the Lord, we will renew our strength. It says he makes us lay down in green pastures, leads us beside quiet waters. Why? To refresh our souls. Jesus modeled this waiting when he made intentional time to be alone with the Father. He would go away to wait and hear for him to speak that voice of leading that he desired so much. Jesus actually waited 30 years before it was right for him to begin in ministry. 30 years. We complain sometimes about three days. He waited 30 years. And it says of him in that waiting time that he grew in stature and in favor with God and men. He was being prepared. In all this waiting, as we are still, 
God sees our availability for his purposes. Yes, it's incredibly easier to be busy. And the disciples were ready to go out and share this gospel message that they had, but they were not yet prepared. They needed to wait to receive the power necessary for the mission. Constantly being busy doesn't solve much. It just adds more work. Mary saw the better way. When Jesus came into their house, she sat at his feet and enjoyed time with him. She rested and waited with him. Martha got busy. She missed what was better. She did not make room to have the posture of availability. Mary saw the better way. Now, there are times when work needs to be done, but there are specific moments where we have to be willing to wait and set our posture as one of, Lord, I am available. Don't miss that point. Go be still. Be available. Receive this promise. Waiting will also show that we are submitted to kingdom principles. When it comes to receiving the power we seek as believers, the one outline in Acts It is important to remember we do so in order to see the kingdom come to earth. We do so to take part in the work of the kingdom among those that we live with. There's a very shocking uh, story that illustrates this in Acts chapter 8 about Simon Magus, or you may know him as Simon the sorcerer. Philip was preaching to a group and Simon was among them, and they all came to believe in the salvation of Jesus, and they were baptized in water. Later, Peter and John are called for, and they come and they present the message of baptism in the Holy Spirit. Having seen this new power, Simon offers to pay the disciples to buy the power. It doesn't outline what it looked like for him. He just wants to buy this power. See, he made the mistake of believing that he could purchase it for his own use. Simon is a professional magician. That's what magus means, the magician. And saw, he saw the power of the Spirit as one more power to acquire so that he could exploit it for financial gain. See, Simon was more interested in what he could gain with this power than what it would prosper the kingdom. He was not submitted to the principles of God's kingdom. The gift of God to us is not a tool to be manipulated. The Holy Spirit is a person, not a power to be exploited for personal gain. He is the one who brings us in line with kingdom goals, and though he does empower us, we do not control when or how it happens. Simon wanted personal gains. The Spirit desires kingdom growth. When we come to a place of waiting, we will often find that in those moments we begin to discover the principles of the kingdom. Uh, We discover the principles of the kingdom with greater clarity, and our hearts and spirits are drawn toward them. When they gathered in the upper room, they were focused on the promise Jesus spoke of, the Spirit who would empower them and preach to, to preach the gospel. There's no mention of propelling their lives forward. There's no thought of protection from danger. There's no instance or idea brought forth about prosperity. Just serving Jesus, preaching the message of salvation to the world no matter the cost. This is the principle of the kingdom, that we be a people who are committed to the mission of Christ to seek and save the lost through his ministry of reconciliation. When we submit to these principles, we place ourselves in a position to receive. Finally, in the waiting, the disciples' posture was set to be one of united purpose. We talked about being, having a unified approach last week and how it benefits the church But it needs to be mentioned that the unity within the church and the unity for those who were gathered in the upper room, it's mainly the full benefit for the kingdom. It's good for us to be unified, but it's in full benefit to the kingdom. As the disciples waited for the promise, the things which would cause arguments, differences, and even disruptions were put aside as they began to understand the incredible weight of that which lay before them. They would need to work together, one with another. Some they would not know well. Some they may not get along with. Some they don't agree with. But they would need to work together in order to see the message preached to all the corners of the world. They would know in this posture of being committed to the kingdom that being united in purpose was the only way forward in strength. Would the power come? Yes. But if they could not be unified in their purpose, they will, would they be unified with the purpose of the Spirit 
or move more towards self-advancement with this new power. When we set to waiting on the Lord, creating a posture within ourselves to receive the power he promises through the Spirit, we are committing to Jesus, to each other, to be united in purpose. The one given at the end of Matthew 28 outlined as the Great Commission. The one to which we should wake up every day and pray God, pray to God for the strength, creativity, boldness, and power to be a part of. The disciples knew what was ahead of them. They may not have known the fullness of it all, but they knew the basic instruction given to preach the gospel to all people. This is their unified purpose. This is our unified purpose. I want to tell you the story about the time when I received this power. I remember it being taught about in the church, at youth group, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights. I remember being interested in it, reading about it, having all these questions. So anytime that it came up, I paid attention. I asked questions. Then I began to pray, God, if it's your will, let this come upon me. I'm ready whenever you are. Then I remember going to a youth convention and sitting down. And the first night, Halloween night, the speaker got up and spoke about the power of the Holy Spirit coming on you to preach the gospel, empowered through his presence. And I knew at that moment that I was ready. And so he said, if you've been praying for this and you know what this is, would you come and receive? And I went forward and I prayed and I received that night. And it was a moment that I recognize in that timeline of my life, I was entirely sold out to the purposes of God. It's not that I'm not right now. It's that in those moments early on in my faith, I was internally ablaze for God more than I ever was. It was my first great uh, personal awakening. We go through those times. You know what it's like. Sometimes you're in a valley and you feel dry and sometimes you're on that mountaintop and you're just ablaze for him. That was that first great moment of awakening for me. That's when I received it. And I would think that many who are listening are interested in this promise of Jesus to receive the power from the Spirit to speak the truth to those around us. Let me encourage you to seek if you feel led. But know the truth. The power promised in Acts 1 and delivered in Acts 2 is for the advancement of the kingdom around this earth. It is not for our personal gain, though we do benefit. The power is chiefly to spread the gospel. Now, if you find yourself among those who would like to receive, position yourself by waiting. It will set your posture as one in alignment with what God is up to. It will give you the expectancy in order to be patient. It will give you a desire to do God's work, and it will prepare you for the season ahead. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for your promise, that you promised your spirit to those who waited and as they were patient and they came in expectancy and desire to do your work and they prayed together, God, you delivered your promise upon them. And they took that and they created a sharing of the gospel that carried forth from Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, all the corners of the earth, throughout Rome, into many areas. And eventually, Lord, it came to us that we are able to hear the message of salvation that's been empowered by your spirit through someone else sharing it to us, and we've committed our lives to you. And so, Lord, I pray to anyone listening who has a desire in their life to receive this power, that they would simply ask to receive, that they would be patient, that they would wait as needed, that they would pray and be expectant of the promise. God, that there would be a knowledge in their heart of what it is, that it is to share the story of the gospel in power to all who would listen. And so, Father, any who are praying right now, I pray that you would come upon them in their house and grant them this incredible gift that you have given us. Father, we bless you today. We thank you for the story of Pentecost and what it means. And I thank you even for the season of waiting and preparation that we are in. Don't let us miss it, Lord. Open our eyes to the fact that you're getting us ready for something. You're preparing us for what will come. Help us to be positioned for it. Bless each one watching, Lord. Give them an incredible measure of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
gather here today and just praise your name and lift up everything that we have to you even though there's these circumstances that we have no control of that you're just there watching over us and that you know who we are and that you know that you love us and just thank you so much for letting us be here and gather no matter what that looks like just for every one of you here stay safe i love you all have a good one